What I'm doing tonight is I'm taking questions and have done this in a while. I used to call it Stump the Preacher. And um, I've got the email that I tweeted out earlier was pastormikeonline at gmail.com. So if you have a question you'd like for me to answer tonight, uh, tonight's your night. I'll do that. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll just ask God to bless us tonight and to lead us. And maybe somebody, maybe somebody asks a question that maybe it's something you thought of, never, never really thought to ask and didn't know. Or maybe you thought you knew something and somebody asks a question and I give biblical reasons why I believe some things I believe. And you think, well, I guess maybe I was wrong about that. So I, I tell you what I'll do is I'll start it out here in a minute with a question that some people have asked me. And I'll explain why I believe what I believe. But let's go to our Heavenly Father tonight. Uh, again, pray for all of Sister Linda's family. Pray that the gospel that I, I tried to make it as plain as I could, just spell it out what the gospel is there at her funeral Friday that uh, that it would reach some of her family members. I, I love that family dearly. And, um, you know, I told him, I said, I hate that I meet you guys on funerals, you know. So I invited them to church and we'll just see what happens. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you so much. We thank you, God, for a beautiful day. Lord, you've given us an early spring. And Father, I guess that's okay. Lord, we thank you, God, for the way you love us, the way you take care of us, the way you take care of this world. Uh, this whole world is in your hands. And nothing, and I mean absolutely nothing, has taken place, has happened, will happen. Nothing is created, Father, without you. You have designed and created everything you even, Father, you said that you even created evil. And we believe that, Father. We may not understand it, but we believe it. So, Lord, we pray, God, that you would just guide us as we go into the depths of your word to learn some things that people have had on their minds. And they, they're sharing their hearts tonight. Father, help me be a faithful witness to your word that what I believe and what I say uh, Lord, if there's any answers to be given, let them be given from the Word of God. So, Father, we just ask you for this and ask for your blessings tonight. Bless all of those, Lord, who love you and are willing to serve you with their life. As we pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Now, uh, believe it or not, uh, one, of, one of the questions that I've been asked before and... I'll be honest with you, there are not very many pastors who talk about this subject. Not, not many at all. Uh, I'm one of a few. And, um, and of course, with me, everything that I've ever wanted to know about anything in, that goes on in this world, I've always had a curious mind, always searching out mysteries and things and so on and it's, it's just always been my nature if uh, somebody told me that the other day there was a ufo sighting in jefferson county i don't know if you heard that or not but I, somebody sent me the text and shared that with me my mom told me and i never knew this she knew that i had had an interest in this all my life never said it and I taught it one night in church and my mom came to me and told me that her and a friend of hers, they were coming back from town at night and they had to pass by this lake and there was this bright glowing disc shaped object hovering above this lake and all of a sudden it zoomed up into the sky and was gone. And they both looked at each other. What in the world was that? And never seen anything like it before. Haven't seen one since. I've never seen one personally. I've never seen anything like that that I know of. Uh, my son Matthew said that he saw one coming back from, he used to see this little gal that lived down by Grandview School. And he was coming back one night and he saw uh, just this big amber colored orb 
lighting up the sky and then it took off. So some people ask me why I believe, do I believe in UFOs and what do I believe about UFOs? Do, what, do I believe in aliens? What do I believe about aliens? Surely, Pastor Mike, you don't believe little green men from Mars living on that planet are coming here. No, I don't. I do not believe that issue right there or that the way some say it is, I don't believe that. But I can tell you that about every year, some one and a half million or more people in this country, in just this country, see things that they cannot explain. They have taken photographs, they have taken video. We now know that the government has released three videos through the Pentagon Department of Defense that have been taken from the cameras of our jets sent to defend our country. They were called specifically to go and investigate these things that popped up on radar that they had no idea what they were. There's a man by the name of David Fravor David Fravor is a highly decorated, highly skilled Air Force pilot, naval pilot, and very, very skilled at what he does, very good at what he does. He's handling a piece of equipment that cost about a billion dollars, and he was sent down to investigate this thing that was hovering. It's called the Tic Tac UFO. He said, this thing was hovering just above the water, and he said, when it detected me, it engaged me. And he said, so I knew I was do dealing with something that had intelligence behind it. And he said, it had no wings, no exhaust, no jet plumes that he could see, no propellers, no means of propulsion whatsoever. And he said, yet this thing was able to do things that staggered my mind. He said, I've never seen, he said, I know practically every air airplane that we have in America and we don't, own, what he said was, I would love to get in the seat and fly that thing, whatever it was. He engaged it for several minutes. He captured it on his, on his uh, forward looking infrared camera, this video camera, that video has been released that's called the tic tac ufo there was another one that was called the go fast because that's what it was doing it was going at incredible speeds there was another one that was called the gimbal and it seemed to be it, it would rotate and it was actually rotating and flying fast into a very strong headwind again no wings no propulsion they did, didn't detect any heat source coming out of it. You know, if you're going to fly a plane through the air, you're taking air in and you're pushing something out the tail end of it to push you forward. And he said, these things just didn't have anything like that. So I've always been fascinated by those. But as a Christian, how do I, how do I handle that? Do I believe that that is a mass delusion that everybody's having? If that's the case then we have pilots who are the front line of our defense flying billion dollar machines that are having hallucinations in the air. If that's the case, we're in trouble. Okay, if these guys are having you know, delusions up there, they could be firing missiles at nothing and cause a war. So I started studying um, in Ezekiel chapter one very quickly. I'll give you my impression of what these are. And I'm not going to spend any, you know, just, I'm not going to spend all the time on this tonight. But it's a question that some people ask. And, I, and I'm sure there are people who are, who have, you know, belonged to this church that if I ask them, you believe in UFOs? No, I don't believe in anything like that. However, and I understand that. Because so much ridicule goes along with it. There's so much, uh, if you tell somebody that you just saw a flying saucer or a UFO, they'll think you're nuts. There is a stigma that goes with that, and yet, these things keep appearing. In 1990, what was it, 94, 95, 
There was about a million people in Phoenix, Arizona that saw the Phoenix lights. They saw the outline of a triangular UFO, unidentified object in the sky. The governor saw it, launched an investigation, got nowhere with the Air Force. They at first said, we don't have anything up in the sky. A few days later, they come out and say, oh, we were dropping flares. Why didn't you say that the other night? But when you look at the video, flares do different things than these lights were doing. These lights were staying in place. Flares drop and you can see smoke trails coming from them. So people are seeing them more and more and more. And I believe there's a reason for that. In Ezekiel chapter 1, in verse 4, Ezekiel said, I looked and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and in fire enfolding itself and a brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof is the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire, also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. This was their appearance. They had the likeness of man. And I won't read all of that for time's sake. But um, then if you notice that in verse uh, 14, the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. One of the things that's said about these UFOs is that they have the ability to pause in midair, take off immediately without acceleration, stop immediately without deceleration, make right angle turns without slowing or curving. And if there was a human in that, surely they would be crushed because the laws of physics, our bodies can't handle that kind of that kind of maneuvering. And here you see that these living creatures had the ability to go and return as a flash of lightning. They were that fast. Then you notice that in verse 16, the appearance of the wheels in their work was like the color of barrel. So these four living creatures had wheels next to them. And above them was a platform like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. When Solomon made the thing that was to hold the Ark of the Covenant, that's essentially what he made. He made a big chariot with wheels, axles, a big crystal platform, and then the Ark of the Covenant sat on top of that. What you're looking at in Ezekiel 1 is God's chariot. The book of Psalms says, the chariots of the Lord are 20,000, even thousands of angels. Now, Eric Von Daniken, the guy who wrote um, uh, Chariots of the Gods back in the early 70s, said he was raised in, he went to Catholic school, he was raised a Roman Catholic, but he said the Bible cannot be God's word and this cannot be God. If you're God, why are you riding around in a chariot? Why do you have to do that? Well, I honestly do not know the answer to the question of why God rides a chariot, but he does. You see it repeatedly in the scriptures. And the chariot that God rides on is not driven by angels, but literally that those chariots are living beings. If you notice in verse 17, when they went, they went upon the four sides and they turned not when they went. As for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful and their rings were full of eyes round about them four. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Notice this, whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went. There, there, there was their spirit to go and the wheels were lifted up over against them. And notice this, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. These wheels literally were alive. They were alive. This chariot that God was riding on was a living thing. Now, if that's hard for you to swallow... I want you to think about now the cars that are being made now. The cars that are coming out now are coming out with artificial intelligence. First time I drove, I drove a rental car from Minneapolis to Fargo because no planes was going to Fargo because it was snowing. 
So we rented this car and I kept telling Lisa, I said, this thing's pulling my wheel. Something's wrong with this thing. Well, come to find out, it had an AI system in it that when that car detected that I was too close to the line, it was jerking the wheel back over to get me back in the lane. And I'm going, I don't like this. Well, my wife said, well, pay attention then. <laughs> hey, but we're making cars that are becoming more and more and more intelligent every single day. At some point, the vehicles that you ride in are going to be artificially intelligent, self-aware. And that in itself is the proof of life. That it is intelligent enough to know what it wants. Okay? A dog, they're not on the same level as us. But a dog knows what it wants when it wants it, does it? And that's what we're doing now. We're creating things. It's called the Internet of Things. We're creating things that think automatically. And at, right now, they're our servants. At some point, they're going to be our masters. Okay? So that just, I'll stop there. But that's just one reason why I believe these things are real. Because God said that I made angels to be chariots. And that's what I think people are seeing. I think they're seeing evil angels, evil spirits who are entering into this earth. They're up to no good. I won't get into the whole plan. But they're coming down here. And God has even written down what he's going to do to them if they come down here messing with us, he's even written down what he would do if they start doing that. And, and I believe they have. So that's the first question. Now, let me look at my email here. Uh, let's see here. Here's one. I think this is the first one that came in. I saw this on Facebook the other day. Would you address this? The doctrine of rewards or the judgment seat of Christ. A red flag came up when I saw the title, Doctrine of Rewards. Thank you. Um, turn to Matthew. And I might have to have, let's see here, I might have to get out all my phones and Bible search programs and everything else. Uh the, the story of the stewards, where, um, let me type this in here. Steward is not a valid, re oh, huh? I believe it's in Matthew. No, no. No, 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 no. 16. Where he gives to his three stewards, he gives to one five portions. Huh? Talent. Now, it's a story of talents. The talent. Okay, yes, the talents. That's what I'm looking for. And, and here's why they're bringing this up. Okay. Um, the, the doctrine that says, here we go. Okay, Matthew 25. That's kind of where I thought it was. In Matthew chapter 25. There, is, there are those who say, you cannot lose your salvation no matter what. If you prayed one time 35, 40 years ago and you've lived, a satanic life ever since then, you're still going to heaven. You just won't get the rewards that, that I will get. And that to me just, oh, that irks me. And they use this story, Matthew chapter 25. Uh, let's pick it up in, uh, let's see here. 
Verse 15, unto the one he gave five talents, and to the other two, uh, to another two, and to the another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. So when, when you ask these people who believe this doctrine, can you be saved and live like a Satanist for the rest of your life? Are you still going to heaven? They will say yes. But they will, God will not give them the rewards that he will give others. And I've actually read some people, and some names you would know, who said that there obviously is a place in heaven where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. No! None! But they use that so that they don't have to change their doctrine. That there is like a poor man's heaven that bad Christians go to. Okay? And they use this story. So, verse 16, Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. Verse 18, but he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. And his Lord said unto him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. Now, their doctrine, their teaching says that this second man got a lesser reward than the first one did. But look at what he said. He, the Lord said unto him, well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. What was it that he said that was different than what he said to the first guy? Not one single word. Not one single word did he say was different. Now, the next guy. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and entering, gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, here thou hast that is thine. In other words, I give you your talent back. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant. Now, supposedly this guy's saved. According to that doctrine, this guy's still saved. But his Lord called him wicked. How can that be? And then he said, Thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and that at my coming I should have received mine with, uh, own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it to them which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he sh shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And they say that must be a part of heaven. No way. You see, that's, that's easier than changing your doctrine and admitting you're wrong. And I'll be honest with you. A lot of the churches and pastors and Bible colleges that believe that are King James only ones. But they won't change their doctrine for nothing. So they've come up with this idea that these guys all got different rewards for serving God. Now, the master was wise, wasn't he? When he gave the five talents to the one man, why did he give it to him? Because he knew he was gifted enough to bring other five in. Why did he give, you know, I've tried for years to fill every pew in this church. I failed. Okay. And the, the one time years ago, God and I had talked about it. God said, Mike, I'll be the one that brings people in, not you. That's my job. 
So trust me, Mike. I'll do it. I'll bless you if you'll just trust me. But why are there not 150 people sitting here every Sunday? Maybe my talent is not sufficient for that. Maybe it's just something I can't do. Does that mean that I haven't done as much as some other preacher has done? No. Not at all. God told Abraham, I am thy exceeding and great reward. So, what part of heaven is an exclusive part where only certain people can be at? Nowhere. Nowhere. All right. So I hope that answered your question. Now, where's the rest of them? Click. Come on. No, I don't want to restore pages. Anybody here have one? Did anybody here have a question they want me to answer? Oh, there we go. Here's another one. Hi, Pastor Mike. Thank you for answering questions today. Luke 17, 26. Let's turn to Luke 17, 26. I guarantee on one of these I'm going to read it and I'm going to say, I have no idea. Let's move on to the next one. <laughs> Luke 17, 26. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. Then he says, Genesis 6, 11, The earth also was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. Do you believe the corruption of the earth is referring to the earth itself being ruined by man with pollution, deforestation, genetically modified plants and animals, etc. I've always wondered if this is referring to man, his heart and physical violence or the physical earth itself. Now, um, we know, in fact, let's, let's turn to Genesis Six, and I'll read a verse here to you. I will say that ultimately God's punishment with the flood primarily was man's fault. Okay? In verse six, or verse five of chapter six, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And he said, um, let's see here. Verse 11, the earth also was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. So, a couple of things I see is that God is primarily directing this judgment at mankind. Man is the one who has gotten to a point where all of his imaginations are wicked and evil. He doesn't think about God, entertain God in his mind or his heart. All he thinks about is evil, evil, doing more evil, more evil, more evil. That's what he does. Now, as a result of that, I'll, I'll say this. I am a staunch capitalist. I do not believe that communism in any form works. I don't think, in fact, communism is nothing more than what we know about the Clintons, the Bidens, the Pelosi's, and their tax-deductible charitable organizations, their foundations. They're all a money grab. All this aid money that they're talking about in this next coronavirus bill, all of that aid money that gets sent to all these countries, they've already got it arranged with these countries 
that somebody in that country is going to slide back a couple hundred million into the Clinton's accounts, the Biden's accounts, the Pelosi's accounts, and all these other foundations. We already know that. Okay? Having said that, however, about capitalism, I know that capitalism, by an immoral person, he will take advantage of poor people. He will use uh, poverty labor, paying them poverty wages, so that he himself can enrich himself. That, I believe, is corrupt, it is immoral, and it's wrong. And it has an effect. He will dump his pollutants in any place that he can get by with it, regardless of what it does 20, 30 years down the road. That's already been proven. Pe companies do that. The movie Aaron Brockovich was all about that. They caught that company red-handed. That guy saved all of those documents that he was told to destroy. And it was basically the smoking gun that this company knew they were dumping toxic waste and it was ending up in the well water giving all these people cancer. So they knew that's what it was. So... I'm not some big environmentalist. The, the question here, do you believe the earth, the corruption of the earth is referring to uh, pollution, deforestation, things like that? Yes, in a way, because I believe man is the culprit of that. And he's taking, God told us to replenish the earth. It is responsible that if you cut so many trees down out of the forest, if you're a lumber company, to then go back and plant some more so that in another 20, 30 years, you've got new stuff to cut down. Yes, Chris? Uh, Genesis 1, 31 says, God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. Yeah. So everything that man is able to do here is stuff that's already here, of course, by God. Yeah. Man doesn't create anything, medicine, anything. Exactly. It isn't here because it's by God's choice. Yeah. So That corrupts it, yeah. So I do think it all goes back to mankind. And we also know then that the giant's issue had come in and it appears as if most, if not all, of humanity had been infected with those genes somehow, some way. That's my guess on it. It's not 100%. That's my guess. When it, when it says that all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth, and then it says of Noah that God saw Noah that he was perfect in his generations, that was his genetics. It appears that Noah was, him and his family may very well have been the only ones who had not been infected with that giant seed, that giant DNA. Because those inhabitants now were no longer human. They were not the species, like Chris said. God didn't make them right. He made them how he wanted them to. But what's, what's all these companies doing now, Chris? To every corn crop, rice, wheat, soybeans... They're genetically modifying everything. And we're not smart enough to know what that's going to do 10, 20 years down the road to the whole planet. God's going to, re God, in Leviticus 26 and in uh, Revelation, God's going to release diseases and plagues. What's to say that those things didn't pop up because we kept messing with everything? That's a very good question. I appreciate you sending that in. Let's see here. Next one. Uh, how would you know when God is going to move you from one church to another? Well, and I'm, I'm, I know the guy who wrote this. I'm not reading names deliberately. Um, Lisa and I were married here. We were fine here. I was working for Brother Ron Dagonia. We were starting a family. And I was learning a trade and everything was fine. But then God started working on me. And I mean hard. Because I had put the ministry 
way back in the back of my mind. And I just wasn't even looking to get into the ministry. At some point, God made me absolutely miserable. And I couldn't take it. So I had to talk with my wife. Now that scared her. She likes to stay close to her mom and dad. And that's where she is right now. Staying with her mom and dad. Monica's the same way. That's where Monica is right now. Working with her mom and dad. Helping them. Lisa was naturally afraid that God would call me somewhere. I would have gone anywhere. So I brought it up to her. Then I went to a former pastor of mine, P Preacher Golf, who worked with me when I accepted the call to preach, married Lisa and I, and he was at another church, and I went and talked to him. And then I talked to my boss, Ron. Ron told me his story, that when he was in high school, he knew God called him to preach. And as soon as he graduated high school, he was headed to seminary to go preach in the Southern Baptist Convention. And he said, after high school, his brother gave him a job taping drywall. Ron's pretty good at it. And he was making good money. So he kept working and he kept saying, well, I'll save up some money. That way I can go. The next year, same thing. I'm going to save up more money and then I'll go. And then after a while, he's not going. So he gets off into sin. One marriage collapsed. His second marriage, it almost collapsed. And God got a hold of Ron in a jail cell one night. The devil said, Ron, I can make you do whatever I, I want. And it scared him. And he told me this. And he said, Mike, if God's telling you to serve him and to preach, you better do it. Or the mistakes you make will be irreversible. So I shared that with my wife. We prayed. I didn't think, I told God, God, I can go anywhere. Lisa said, I don't want to move away from my mom and dad. She didn't really put her foot down on that. I didn't think God can answer both prayers. But sure enough, that little church up in Richwoods, they, their pastor had just resigned. It's as far away from our house as this church is. So I've never driven a farther distance to go to either church. And then I served there three years. And again, it was my wife. God used my wife as a second witness. Can two walk together except they be agreed? And I didn't know it, but God had been talking to her about me quitting there, coming here. Then God began to lay it on my heart. God was laying it on the heart of some people here at the church. And I, we didn't know this, but then it just became obvious and I'll tell this young man that sent this verse in. The Israelites had it easy. When they walked out of their tent in the morning, if that pillar of cloud was there at the tabernacle, that meant you're staying here today, go milk your goats, feed whatever you got to feed, take care of stuff, worship me, we're staying here. But if they got up the next morning and that cloud had moved to the next valley, that meant get up. And God was patient to wait for them. And I never forget what Preacher Goff told me. The night I was at this altar, he preached, Must Jesus Bear His Cross Alone? And I came down and I said, I think God's called me to preach. He counseled with me after the service. He said, Mike, how many times did God call Samuel? And we looked it up, and I said, well, it looks like he called him four times. He said, I'd rather have God call me four times and me know it than to think he called me once and be wrong. 
And there was two other young men that after I did that, they said God called them to preach. Neither one of them are in the ministry. Now, it's not, I'm not boasting. I'm just saying it looked like they were doing that because I had done it. They were following me. And um, what I'll tell you is God will make it so absolutely obvious that you'll literally be left without another choice is what he'll do. God knows how to do that. And I just believe in the sovereignty of God. If God says, I want you here, you're going to be there. The next day you're going to be there. You say, well, Jonah ran from God. Did God know Jonah was going to do that? Sure he did. It wasn't without his, his knowledge. He knew about it. He had prepared the great fish long before Jonah ever came up. So God will make it absolutely known to you by the multitude of witnesses that that's what he wants you to do. All right, let me do one more here. Uh, anybody else? Does anybody here have anything? Yes, Melissa. Ezekiel 13 what? Okay, the next question after that is, no. Yeah. Let me, let me, get, some, let me get some context here. Verse 15, thus will I accomplish my wrath upon the wall and upon them that have daubed it with untempered Mortar and will say unto you, the wall is no more, neither they that daubed it. To wit, what he's talking about, the prophets of Israel, which prophesy concerning Jerusalem, which see visions of peace for her, and there is no peace, saith the Lord. Likewise, so this fits into what I just read. Thou son of man, set thy face against the daughters of thy people, which prophesy out of their own heart and prophesy against them. And say, thus saith the Lord, woe to the women that sew pillows to all armholes and make kerchiefs upon the head of every stature to hunt souls. Will ye hunt the souls of my people? Will ye save the souls alive that come unto you? Will you pollute me among my people for handfuls of barley? And for pieces of bread to slay the souls that should not die and to save the souls alive that should not live by your lying to my people that wear, that hear your lies. Wherefore thus saith the Lord God, behold, I'm against your pillows wherewith ye there hunt the souls to make them fly. And I will tear them from your arms and will let the souls go, even the souls that you hunt to make them fly." Your kerchiefs also will I tear and deliver my people out of your hand. and They shall be no more in your hand to be hunted. And you shall know that I am the Lord. The only thing that I can think of is that they were sowing things for women to adorn themselves with that there must have been some pagan doctrine that told them if you wear these things and have these things then the gods will favor you somehow or you'll receive special benefits from God and so on. It's like Joyce Myers in, in 2004 after the Post-Dispatch wrote this pretty they basically told everything about her and it didn't make her look good. Okay, she then has to have her press agent get with News Channel 5 and they did an interview with her and she basically said, I'm rich because I deserve to be. I've done the work that God's told me to do and he has blessed me. He owes it to me. Things like that. So it looks to me like there was something that was said to those ladies that if they wear this 
And if they do these things and have these pillows under their arms and these head garments or whatever, then the gods will favor them somehow. But do they make them and give them away to them? What did he say in here? That they were selling them to them. They were making gain off of that. Like the money changers. Or like uh, Alexander the coppersmith who hated Paul. Why? Because Paul's telling everybody, you don't need that bronze statue of Diana. You don't need that. God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. And they hated Paul. They wanted him dead. They were going to kill him. So that's what it looks like to me. That they were making special types of garments and selling them to people telling them that they had to have it. Some of these guys still do it, like Peter Popoff. In other words, they'll, for your love offering of so-and-so, they'll send you this anointed cloth with water from the River Jordan that's been blessed, and it's holy water, and it's been sprinkled on there, and you lay that under your head at night, and it'll kill your headaches, and put it on your back, or whatever it is, and God's healing power will come on there. And they're going to send it to you, and they're going to, you're going to give money to them for that, and it's a big scam. To me, that's what I'm seeing here. And it comes in various forms. It's like uh, some women, God leads them to wear a dress everywhere they go. Okay? But does that make them more holy? And does, that, does God favor them more than a woman who doesn't wear a dress everywhere she goes? You're not saved by dresses. God gives you grace. And things you don't deserve because he loves you and he gives it to you freely. Amen. All right. Let's stand to our feet.